Hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going to explain ND2 in the Black-Scholes formula. While my intention is to explain ND2 in simple terms, some of the general concepts are only briefly discussed, and some additional research by the viewer for other parts of the formula may be necessary. I have additional videos covering different parts of the Black-Scholes formula in more detail. The Black-Scholes formula prices a European-style call option. The formula is based on statistical probability, and pretty much all pricing and finance is developed from the concepts found in this formula. Because parts of the formula are difficult to understand, I go over and repeat some of the more complicated parts several times during the video. We'll start with the general concepts, and then go over the math. So let's get started. Looking at the formula, we have the price of the call equals the stock price times ND1 minus the strike price times E raised to negative RT times ND2. S is the stock price and K is the strike price. However, that is not today's value of the strike price. That is the value of the strike price in the future when the option expires. To get today's value of the strike price, we have to subtract off what is known as the time value of money, which is the interest one can get on a risk-free investment. In other words, if the strike price is $10 and it expires in six months, then we have to subtract off the interest one would make in a risk-free investment during those six months to get today's value of the strike price. That's E raised to negative RT. E raised to negative RT discounts the strike price to today's value. ND2, the subject of this video, is the probability that the stock price will be at or above the strike price when the option expires. ND1 is what is known as a conditional probability. ND1 is a bit confusing, so I will explain it in a couple of different ways. ND1 is the future value of the stock if, and only if, the stock price is above the strike price at expiration. Another way of stating it is, if and only if the option expires in the money, ND1 is the probability of how far into the money the stock price will be. Another way of stating it is that ND1 is the future expected value of the stock multiplied by the probability that the stock price will be at or above the strike price. Each day, the price of an asset such as a stock is the previous day's price times E raised to some value U. The U is the periodic rate of return, the rate that the asset increased or decreased that day. Because the rate of return on an asset is a random number, to model the movement and determine the possible future values, we use a formula that models random movements. This was first done about a hundred years ago by a man named Louis Bachier, who applied Brownian motion, a formula used to model random movements in physics, to the movement of the price of an asset. Brownian motion assumes that there are two parts to random movement. The first is an overall constant driving force called the drift. The second is a random component. Therefore, the rate that the asset increases each day, the U value that E is raised to, can be broken down into two parts, an overall drift and a random stochastic component. The no riskless arbitrage argument tells us that if it were possible to remove the risk from all assets, then all assets must increase at the same rate or one could engage in riskless arbitrage. In other words, with the risk removed, if assets did not grow at the same rate, then one could place offsetting trades and make a profit without any risk of losing money. Therefore, with the risk removed, the rate of return on an asset must be the risk-free rate, which is the rate one can get now on a risk-free investment such as a government bond. The no riskless arbitrage argument tells us that if it were possible to remove the risk from a stock, the stock would drift up at the risk-free rate. In other words, the stock would grow at a constant rate, and that rate would be the same rate as any other asset with no risk. Including the risk back in means including the volatility, which comes from random people buying and selling the stock all day long. This erodes the drift at the rate of half the variance over time, and adds a random factor in that combines with the drift such that the actual rates of return, the actual U values that we see each day, are random values. So let's break that down. Today's stock price equals yesterday's stock price times E raised to U. Theoretically, if we could remove all risk from the stock, the stock should drift up in value on a constant rate over time, 
the same rate that one can get now on a risk-free asset. Adding the risk back in means adding in the volatility. This erodes the drift at the rate of half the variance over time and adds a random factor in that combines with the drift such that the actual rates of return are random values. Because each day the asset can increase or decrease at any random rate, the central limit theorem in statistics tells us that we can assume that the periodic daily rates of return will be normally distributed. In other words, if we make a graph of the periodic daily returns and we graph enough of the periodic daily returns, we assume that the graph will form a normal distribution bell-shaped graph. For an example, I have here a histogram graph of the periodic daily returns for GLD, the gold ETF. Graphed are all 2,239 periodic daily returns covering the entire life of the asset. As you can see, while not a totally perfect bell shape, the curve does resemble pretty close to a normal bell. This means that we can assume that the rates of daily change of price in the future will also be normally distributed. In other words, the graph of possible future periodic daily rates of return is a normal distribution curve using the drift as the mean and using the historical standard deviation as the assumed future standard deviation. And that's Brownian motion in the Black Shows formula. The drift, which is the risk-free rate eroded by volatility at the rate of half the variance over time. But that drift has a random part that combines with the expected rate of return to give an actual rate of return that is normally distributed. In short, Brownian motion means that if we graph the future periodic daily returns, we assume that the graph will form a normal distribution bell-shaped curve using the drift as the mean and using the historical standard deviation as the future standard deviation. The total area under a normal distribution curve represents all probability of an event occurring. In asset modeling, the normal distribution curve is a graph that represents the total probability or odds of what the future rate of return will be. We can use this to find the probability or odds that the stock price will be above or below a certain level by a certain date in the future. For instance, we can use this to determine the probability that the price of a stock will be above the strike price of an option on the day that the option expires. The rate of growth in the future is represented by a probability or odds distribution graph. We find the rate of growth it would take for the current stock price to be at the strike price at expiration and see where that rate of growth falls onto the normal distribution graph. To do this, we find out how many standard deviations away the rate of growth from the stock price to the strike price is from the expected rate of growth. This is known as a standardized z-score. To find a z-score, we take the raw data point, which in this case is the rate of growth from the stock price to the strike price, subtract from that the mean of the normal distribution curve, and then divide the results by the standard deviation. The total area under the graph represents the total probability of what the rate of growth will be. If we plot the z-score on the graph, the area to the right of the z-score represents a growth rate that would increase the stock price to a level that meets or exceeds the strike price when the option expires. The area to the left of the z-score represents the probability of the stock price being below the strike price at expiration. In other words, if 30% of the total area under the curve is on the right side of the z-score, then there is a 30% chance that the stock will be at or above the strike price when the option expires. We want the percent of area to the right of the z-score. NZ-score gives the percent of area to the left of the z-score in a normal distribution curve. Because a normal distribution curve is symmetrical, we can find the percent of the area to the right of the z-score by finding n negative z-score. Therefore, D2 equals negative z-score and ND2 is the same as N negative z-score. Let's break that down. The probability or odds of what the future rate of growth will be is represented by a normal distribution graph that uses the drift of the risk-free rate minus half the variance over time as the mean. We need to find the rate of growth from the stock price to the strike price. Strike price equals stock price times E raised to the rate of growth from the stock price to the strike price. If I divide both sides by the stock price, I get strike price divided by stock price equals E raised to the rate of growth from the stock price to the strike price. If I take the natural log of both sides, I get the natural log of the strike price divided by the current stock price 
equals the rate of growth from the stock price to the strike price. The raw data point is the rate of growth from the stock price to the strike price, which is the natural log of the strike price divided by the current stock price. The mean is the risk-free rate minus half of the variance. Therefore, to get the z-score, we take the natural log of the strike price divided by the stock price minus the risk-free rate minus half the variance and divide the whole thing by the standard deviation of one year's worth of the periodic daily returns. We want the area to the right of the z-score. Nz gives us the area that is to the left of the z-score. Because a normal distribution curve is symmetrical, to get the area to the right of the z-score, we could use n negative z and therefore d2 equals negative z. Let's find negative z. z is the natural log of the strike price divided by the current stock price minus the risk-free rate minus half of the variance divided by the standard deviation of one year's worth of periodic daily returns. We can rewrite the natural log of the strike price divided by the stock price as the natural log of the strike price minus the natural log of the stock price using the laws of logarithms. If I take the negative of z, I get the negative natural log of the strike price plus the natural log of the stock price plus the risk-free rate minus half of the variance divided by the standard deviation. I can rewrite it to get the natural log of the stock price minus the natural log of the strike price plus the risk-free rate minus half of the variance divided by the standard deviation. I can rewrite the natural log of the stock price minus the natural log of the strike price as the natural log of the stock price divided by the strike price using the laws of logs. And that brings us to D2. The natural log of the stock price divided by the strike price plus the risk-free rate minus half the variance divided by the standard deviation. To find ND2, we can use the Excel function equals norm s dist negative z-score. Let's put it all together. The future stock price is the current stock price times E raised to some value. What that value will be is represented by a normal distribution graph. We use the drift, which is the risk-free rate minus half of the variance, as the mean of the normal distribution curve. We use the historical standard deviation of one year's worth of periodic data returns as the assumed future standard deviation. We take the rate of growth from the stock price to the strike price, which is the natural log of the strike price divided by the current stock price, and subtract from that the mean of the risk-free rate minus half of the variance, and divide the results by the standard deviation. This gives us the z-score. We want to find the percent of the area in the normal distribution curve that lies to the right of the z-score. n-z-score gives us the area to the left of the z-score. To find the percent of the area to the right of the z-score, we use n-negative z-score. Therefore, nd2 equals n-negative z-score. The equals norm s dist z-score function in Excel gives us the area to the left of the z-score. So we use equals norm s dist negative z-score to get the area to the right of the z-score. And that's nd2, the probability that the stock price will be at or above the strike price when the option expires. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.